Hi, everyone, and welcome to Your Healthy Dose. This is a podcast about current trends in healthcare, and I am your host, Kim Douglas. Today's topic is Alzheimer's, and it's a very interesting topic that so many of us are talking about. We are approaching the first time in human history when we have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. And with an aging population, Alzheimer's is a major concern to so many of us. Here with me today is Dr. Scott Kaiser and Nancy Lynn to talk about the latest with Alzheimer's disease and what we all need to know. Dr. Kaiser is the Director of Geriatric Cognitive Health and provides specialty medical consultations at the Pacific Brain Health Center. And Nancy Lynn is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships partnerships at Bright Focus Foundation, where she funds research for Alzheimer's, and she works to generate greater public awareness of Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. Welcome to both of you for being here. We hear lots of terms used to describe mental decline, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, senility, And we want to know what is the difference between them or are they all just different names for basically the same disease? Yeah, of course. And, you know, just stepping back for a second, Kim, if you think about it, that 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 stat that you pointed out, the first time in human history where we'll have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. That's actually a reflection of incredible public health efforts. I mean, one of society's greatest achievements, that we had a 30-year gain in life expectancy over the last century. Uh, But the downside of that is that as more people get older, more people will suffer from Alzheimer's disease unless we do something about it. Um, In terms of the terminology... Yeah, are they all the same? Yeah, I mean, things are used interchangeably. And to be honest, the terms are changing before our very eyes, right? As our understanding of the disease has changed. But but basically, dementia is a syndrome where you uh, lose memory, cognitive, changes in memory, cognitive, even changes in mood related to some underlying degenerative process in the brain, usually. Uh, Alzheimer's is just the most common form, the most common type. And that's a disease that was you know, described Way back, actually, Dr. Alzheimer, a German psychiatrist and neuropathologist, he had a case where somebody had, it's actually complicated history, but he looked under the microscope at this woman's brain after she passed away and saw these plaques and tangles. And that's the pathognomonic, uh, the hallmark. The hallmark. The hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. And so that's still of how it's named today. But it's 60 to 70% of cases of dementia are from Alzheimer's disease. Interesting. So that little um, statistic, or it isn't even a statistic, but I would hear it all the time. You probably did too, that dementia was you can't remember where you put your keys and Alzheimer's is you don't remember that you had keys. That is not the case, which is good to know. Right, right, right. So what are some of the early warning signs of Alzheimer's? And can you be affected even before you get any of those symptoms? Well, one of the most important things that people could take away from this discussion today is something uh, that's been discovered over the past decade. But the physical, the physiological development of Alzheimer's actually begins 10 to 20 years before any symptoms, even the beginning symptoms appear. And so that's good news in the sense that you can do some things to address that. and bad news that this is starting early, earlier in your life. So um, some of the early warning signs, as opposed to what people would call regular aging, where you may, you know, your processing speed is kind of slowing down. This is really a change. So some of the things people tend to first notice are repeated questions, uh, short-term memory, asking, you asked me that five minutes ago, that kind of thing, or forgetting familiar recipe. You know, my mother made this for decades and suddenly she left out the main ingredient. Something that's a big change, a big changes in mood or interest in engagement. So the key thing is true. I always say it's one thing if you left your keys somewhere, it's another if 
you don't know what a key's for, or if you find your key wrapped in aluminum foil in the freezer. So that's kind of a anecdotal way. Right. Describe. And as Nancy was saying, I mean, the fact that these changes are occurring so many decades before symptoms ever show up, I mean, it's a whole new world in terms of what we're learning in terms of subtle symptoms, subtle signs that people might actually be uh, exhibiting where maybe that might give us the opportunity to identify this many, many years earlier and do something about it. Um, and it's changes in symptoms. It's even now with technology, changes in our voice, changes in the way we move. Um, so it's a really, it's a great time to be thinking about how we can get ahead of this, which will re is really the name of the game. For sure, especially with those statistics of the aging community. So Dr. Kaiser, talk about St. John's holistic approach when someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Yeah, well, I mean, the problem is, um, you know, up until now, all too common a story, and we see this all the time, a patient will come in, you know, they saw specialists and they said, okay, you, you have Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, start investigating nursing homes, you know, make sure your, your, your legal financial affairs are in order, you know, and people really with pretty mild symptoms at that point. I, I looked through one report the other day. It didn't even say anything. I didn't see the word exercise once in there. And so we have a very different sort of perspective on that at the Pacific Brain Health Center in terms of all the things you can do to be proactive about maintaining your brain health, even if you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment, which is a condition that typically precedes Alzheimer's disease. Um, so there's just so much you can do. And that's where we bring a multidisciplinary team of neurologists, neuropsychologists, even psychiatrists, geriatricians, even brain health coaches, nutritionists, uh, all sorts of people who can help you make the kinds of lifestyle changes that will make a positive impact on your brain health. Um, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful, uh, but we're just scratching the surface. We, we really need more. Wow, but that is amazing. I had no idea the nutritional and the coaching. And uh, let me ask you if there's a certain demographic that is affected more than others. Yes, um, first of all, it's worth noting that two thirds of people with Alzheimer's are women. Women also carry the much heavier uh, burden of caregiving. Mm -hmm. So that's something to note. But black Americans are twice as likely to get Alzheimer's. And uh, Latinx Americans are one and a half times as likely. And there's other disparities we call or brain health inequities that are well studied now, um, like uh, Latinx people getting diagnosed typically seven years later than their Caucasian uh, sisters and brothers. And that's why St. John's, um, you know, ha is such a wonderful resource, Pacific Neuroscience Institute, such a wonderful resource. But many, many places in the country, uh, in many places, the communities don't have access to these types of professionals. Sure. And uh, so our field is trying to address that. Yeah, Nancy, I mean, those are such, makes key points there because I mean, this is a this is a disease that impacts everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, who doesn't know somebody or have a family member who's been impacted at this point? And it's a disease that it doesn't just impact the person who's diagnosed, right? The whole family and 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 community. Um, but this fact that it disproportionately impacts women and people of color. I mean, this is really key. This is a this is a social justice issue. Um, you know, I mean, I, I feel like we should be if you if you have a, a a mother, a sister, a daughter, if you're a woman, we should all be taking to the streets really to do something about this, um, because it is an all hands on deck situation where there are public health measures, community health measures and clinical measures that we should be taking and must be taking now. Uh, to do something about this for healthier communities going forward. Exactly. Well, there are truly just a lot of questions when it comes to Alzheimer's. And I have some here that we received from the community. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to kind of shoot these off at both of you. So what can a person do to prevent dementia and Alzheimer's? Prevent it. So that it's funny that that is a controversial concept mm -hmm. in the medical community, it's, you know, the, the using the word prevention, right. because 
I, I understand why that's controversial because I can't say to any one person, if you do X, Y, Z, you will not develop Alzheimer's or if you do X, Y, Z, you will develop Alzheimer's, right? I can't, that, that, that doesn't exist. But if you look across a population, there are many things we can do on an individual level, on a collective level that can drive prevention. For, so for example, the, this commission, the Lancet Commission, studied all of the, the evidence and they yeah. came up with a list of 12 modifiable risk factors that if we address those 12 factors, uh, we could prevent something on the order of 40% of cases of Alzheimer's disease altogether. That means 40% of people who would have gone on to develop Alzheimer's disease having completely healthy, uh, normal cognitive lives. Right? So, so don't, I mean, don't amazing, keep us waiting. Right? Tell right. us, what are they? So it, they, they range. Okay. What's really interesting is that they are things that um, they, they run the gamut from broad public health things to very individual personal health behavior things. They run the gamut from things that happen at a prenatal and, and birth to, to the end of life. So there's always something we can do. You know, for example, on the public health level, a key driver of uh, brain health or, or cognitive decline, the converse, would be uh, education levels or low education levels. So supporting education and getting more broad education uh, out there. Air pollution, again, a big thing that we can't necessarily do so much to control on a personal level, but that is a modifiable risk factor for dementia. And then on the more personal level, things like in midlife, if you have high blood pressure, first of all, screening to see if you have hypertension, but if you have high blood pressure, ensuring that that's adequately treated. High blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, all things. And then health behaviors. Uh, nutrition, uh, what, uh, how much we move, exercise. Um, uh, and so all these smoking obviously is a huge risk factor, uh, excessive alcohol and head injury, avoid keeping, you know, avoiding head injury. There's, there's 12 in the list. I could go through the whole list. Should, I'll, yeah. I'll add three. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, and st stress, managing stress. Yes. Sleeping, getting enough sleep and not being isolated. Mm. As people get older, they tend to get isolated or even if their hearing goes and they're feeling more cut off. But keeping the social engagement, which Scott mentioned, is which really important. hard in a pandemic when we were all shut down. Yes. Wow. All right. How about our next uh, question? And that is, can supplements improve memory and cognition? Yeah. You know, this is a this is a complicated topic as well. Um, you know, I would step back. If I were asking that question, I would step back and, and ask the broader question of, well, the role of nutrients and micronutrients in nutrition, right? And I would really think about a food first approach and say, are there key nutrients that are critical for brain health or that a deficit of those nutrients can put us at risk for cognitive decline? Absolutely. Okay. And I really think a food first approach where you eat a healthy, well-balanced diet uh, Mediterranean. rich in Mediterranean, rich in green leafy vegetables. You know, that is fish, How about uh, coffee and tea, blueberries. We always hear blueberries. I'm Absolutely. always putting them on my Blueberries, Absolutely. almonds, sardines, and salmon. All good stuff. <laughs> okay, All good, good stuff. So that, that, that absolutely. And then in terms of supplements, I think that um, the question would be, well, are you deficient in certain things? Like, uh, are you, you don't need to necessarily take certain supplements, but if you personally had a low level it, and you're not getting it through your diet, it might make sense to take those supplements. And then that's just a, this is an area for more and more research to yeah. think about, are there other supplements that we could be adding uh, more broadly? But I think the key here is a personalized approach yeah. because a one size fits all, uh, that can be quite complicated. It's just not really there. And I, this is a particularly delicate topic for me because there's so many supplements being marketed, especially to older people, and they're very vulnerable. So I would just add in the general sense that there has not been scientific evidence or clinical trials that have proven any of those supplements, including resveratrol from red wine, coconut oil, all the sort of anecdotal things that are supposed to help. There is not evidence that those things impact your cognition. So it's important to know because I, I 
I think I mentioned my own mom, who's 92, has been diagnosed with MCI, and my sister cares for her. And my sister will call me and say, Mom, in the middle of the night, Mm -hmm. Mom ordered this thing that she saw on TV. And so it's just important to know that there is not a scientific basis for just massively buying what's being marketed Thank to you. Thank you. I think that's really And important. besides, if you need zinc, wouldn't you rather get it from oysters or a steak? Than, right. uh... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know what? I'm kind of hungry. Do you mind if we uh, call for lunch or something? No, Perfect. just kidding. Just Perfect. Kidding. You guys are making me hungry. Oysters. Yes, yeah. exactly. So what role, um, if any, does, oh, and we've just talked about that, diet. Yeah. My next question was, what role does diet play? But I think you've pretty much answered that. And I do think what you said is so important about the supplements. I mean, I had heard blueberries, so I was ingesting as many blueberries as I could. But I think what you answered that by saying a whole But it's so approach. important. It is so important. And again, this is one of these things where we don't have to have this fatalistic, nihilistic attitude that, well, you know, it just happens. We can, this is something we can all do today. We can put a healthier arrangement of, you know, brain healthy foods on our plate and enjoy. And it's a, it's a, it, there are great foods yeah. that we can enjoy. And it's not about depriving ourselves of certain things. It's about really, you know, enjoying. Yeah. And I would also emphasize exercise because that is something that has been scientifically proven to help with your brain atrophy, the shrinkage of your brain. And that doesn't mean going and killing yourself at the gym. It's 45 minutes of brisk walking, aerobic, three times a week. And this can significantly slow the decline of one's brain. And you guys are great examples of that. You really are. You're both in great shape. Uh, Are there any clinical trials showing exciting results? Anything new on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, so many things. Uh, We would need a couple more hours to talk. I mean, it's a very exciting time in the field. We're, We're really breaking new ground in so many ways. And you know, I'd say on one end of the spectrum, again, these preventive lifestyle focused kinds of interventions, we're very focused on that type of research at, at PNI and Pacific Brain Health Center, where if you look at all of these factors that we've discussed and you look at ways to optimize it, like, for example, with exercise, we know exercise is great. We also know that cognitive stimulation is great, mental exercise. Well, we've actually done studies where we combine physical exercise and cognitive exercise in unique ways so that you're doing both at once and you get added benefit. But again, I mean, these lifestyle things that whether they're looked at across a population or in these randomized controlled trials where we're doing targeted efforts and other broader lives, I mean, it's really impactful. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are these new uh, therapeutics, these, these targeted antibodies that actually uh, you you infuse these antibodies and they target the amyloid uh, plaques in the brain. So those things that Dr. Alzheimer saw under the microscope, it actually targets. And there was one uh, one drug that effectively cleared those plaques. And it was, and then, but it was very controversial because it it cleared those plaques, but it wasn't clear whether or not that actually had a clinical benefit. Like so, it cleaned up the brain, but did that actually make people better and help their memory and help them function better? And uh, But that drug received accelerated uh, an accelerated pathway FDA approval uh, just because there hasn't been for, for 30 years. There's been nothing uh, that's, that's made a difference. And now there was just, uh, there were study results released very recently of a similar agent that also successfully cleared the amyloid but also seems to have had some clinical benefit. Now there's going to be all sorts of debate about was it significant clinical benefit, you know, but it mm-hmm. the the fact of the matter is things are going in a direction where we're we're you know the, these drugs are starting to have results. Right. Uh, this is one pathway. There's probably 5, 10, 15 other pathways that we'll need to target as well. Uh, but this is a this is really a paradigm shifting moment uh, that we're living through. It's exciting. Yep. You guys are both so passionate about this, and that's what I love. Um, I have a bunch more questions to shoot at you, so here we go. So, what are some activities to keep the brain active and healthy? 
Well, some things that are really terrific, people always hear crossword puzzles and things like that, but the thing that is best are things that make your brain react in, to something it's not expecting. So learning a new language, learning to play an instrument, uh, staying socially engaged where people are with people you don't necessarily see all the time. So uh, the, these are wonderful ways to keep yourself alert. And I'm going to add, even though it's not really part of the literature, keep doing what you love. Mm. Really, I, I mentioned that we, there's the wonderful documentary about Glenn Campbell, I'll Be Me. And he, I think, lasted several years longer in a happy, engaged way because he kept Sing singing and yeah. performing and he would come alive on the stage. And so stay engaged in what you love. That's such a good point, Nancy. And right. there, are, there is literature supporting that in terms of people who have a stronger sense of purpose, people who are socially engaged. I mean, the, the social isolation piece, I mean, we cannot emphasize that enough. It is striking mm. the degree to which loneliness and isolation drive risk for dementia. Um, it Our relationships are so important. It's not like a nice to have. It, this is as important. Human connection is as important as, as air, food, water, shelter. I mean, this is a fundamental human need. And our brains just absolutely uh, need healthy relationships, good human connection to, to thrive. But that sense of purpose, I mean, people, it's been studied in terms of people who volunteer, mm. uh, people who uh, are creatively engaged. Um, so, I mean, we could go on all day. The list of things that you can do to keep your brain healthy is just, it goes on and on. Sure. And it's all great stuff yeah. that will actually help you enjoy life as well. Right. Well, this kind of ties in, and I'm sure you have the same doctor, but you had mentioned your mother. I, my father passed away from Alzheimer's. Do we know if Alzheimer's is hereditary? Yeah, it's a great question. So, and yes, I have a family history as well. So that's probably a big motivator for me in terms of wanting to keep my my brain healthy. So, um, you know, there are there there is a rare familial disorder that's a, this represents a small percentage of cases of Alzheimer's disease that has a very strong, clear genetic component. But for the most part, the vast majority of cases. There are genetic risk factors, uh, but, you know, you can actually get your, your genome, you know, collected and, and, and you can see whether you have at least one of the, the genes that's, a, that's a, an associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. But if, if you have that type of gene and you, even if you have the two copies, it doesn't guarantee that you will or will not get Alzheimer's disease. And more and more studies come out where People have the genetic risk factors, but then they adopt the healthy behaviors, they walk regularly, they, they connect, they have uh, eat a, a healthy diet, and do not go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. So, and I'll, and I'll add to that mention how important it is to get, like you get your eyes checked every year, mm -hmm. to go and get a baseline memory screening so that if you did, for example, what Scott was mentioning was, uh, or Dr. Kaiser was mentioning was, um, there, there there's an early onset form that people tend to get in their 60s rather than the typical onset, which is in your 70s, broadly speaking. And for this early onset that often presents in your 50s or your 60s, there is a, a genetic predisposition, not a guarantee if you have. And so if that's the case, if you're a want to know person and you find that out, then get get that baseline memory screening each year so that you're watching your progress and you're staying engaged. Absolutely. Um, our last question from the community, could there ever be a flat out cure for Alzheimer's? I mean, this is such an important question. And um, the one thing we know is there certainly will not be a cure or even an effective treatment if we don't support the science and the work that needs to be done, which is why it's so important, why I, I invited Nancy to be here today, why Bright Focus and other organizations and the, the research that we're doing at St. John's. I mean, we have to keep fighting, keep pressing on. Now that said, um, I think that we are on the frontier of really breakthrough treatments that will uh, enable people to live full lives uh, unimpacted by this condition. Whether it gets into semantics of, you know, cure, uh, you know, 
I don't, it's hard to say in terms of that particular word, but if you think about it again, if we can detect things early and we can get people on a new trajectory or we can manage things like a chronic condition, like somebody who has diabetes, where they can take multiple different therapies to be able to continue to thrive and, and not suffer from any of the adverse consequences, that to me is, is the goal. Very good. I don't expect that there will be an outright cure in our lifetimes. Most cures for things are found accidentally, in fact. But to, to Scott's point, it's a matter of management. And will it become a manageable condition? Uh, and I've been in this field since about 2009-10 when the National Institutes of Health was spending about $400 million a year on research. Now they're spending over $3 billion a year on research. Our organization, Bright Focus Foundation, has invested about $270 million globally. More, I guess, with this aging population, there's a lot more scientific research happening and real breakthroughs. Up until the clinical trials that Scott was talking about, there were only a few drugs that managed symptoms. And even there, just for about six months, the, the, the what they call symptomatic agents, now we're looking at disease modifying treatments and it's that's huge so a cure probably a cocktail of different things that will help manage and mitigate and uh, the last thing i'll say on that is that uh, there's a wonderful statistic going around that if you could delay the progression of alzheimer's for five years you would eliminate 50 percent of the cases because people would die naturally of other causes which i have to say is more humane it's a more humane and Brilliant. and less expensive to the economy sure. uh, way to go. Yeah, I mean, just think about that. If you think about anybody you know and love who has Alzheimer's disease, if, if you could have five extra great years uh, where you're, you're just fully engaged and um, not having to go through that painful experience that so many go through where someone might not even recognize a loved one and be totally dependent in terms of all fundamental needs and care, um, you know, we have to do better. Absolutely. We have to do better. Yeah. There is some stigma attached to Alzheimer's. And one of the biggest problems is that people just don't know where to go when a family member is diagnosed and what kind of resources are available. So can we talk about that? There's a huge stigma attached with Alzheimer's disease. Um, for, for the obvious reasons, but also if you're still working, for example, are you going to lose your job? Are you? It's, a, it's terrifying. And in different cultural groups, we talked about the health disparities earlier, it's even more so. You don't talk about it. You don't. So um, it's extremely important that people start talking about this and, and dealing with it. And sorry, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> Just, you know, the oh, stigma what and to then do the about resources. It. Yeah. Well, so... so People within range of our voices here have this great re resource. They, they have Scott. They have the uh, Pacific Brain Health Center, P a Neuroscience Institute in St. John's. And so reach out to those places. But in addition, you can call a Bright Focus Foundation, 800 hotline. It's free. You'll get a human being. You can go. There's a wonderful organization here, Alzheimer's Los Angeles, that because when, when this happens, when there's cognitive decline or Alzheimer's or any form of dementia, it's over years. So it's not like you call once and get help. Things are constantly changing and you need people who have gone through this before to help walk you through it and give you those resources. And we are here. We are here if you ask for it. Yeah, that is so true. This stigma piece, it's so, it's so upsetting because it's, it's really unfortunate. Uh, how much harm that does to people. And I've seen people who, you know, we talked about the importance of, of being socially connected and how isolating that can be when you not only have are suffering from or have a loved one suffering from Alzheimer's disease, but that you're you're maintaining secrecy around that and, and not wanting to share that with anybody. And it just really becomes a vicious cycle where that isolation uh, perpetuates things. And I think that what Nancy said about reaching out, um, reaching out for clinical resources like we have here at St. John's, reaching out to community resources like 
uh, Alzheimer's LA, uh, connecting with incredible organizations like the Bright Focus Foundation. There's just so much information. Yeah. There's so much opportunity to to really help find a better path. Absolutely. And there are a lot of support groups on Facebook. Yeah. And you can call your California Area Agency on Aging as well. Right. All right. We're moving on. So um, let's talk about the caregivers. And this is something that is really difficult and they play a very important role. So tell us how important that caregiver situation is. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really um, uh, big, big, big issue here. Right. So um, I, I don't I can't recall the there's some statistic out there about 17 million hours of, of care, 17 million people unpaid hours. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> So don't don't quote me on the numbers because I I should have uh, remembered those before the show. But but anyway, you know the amount of people who are you know really dedicating their lives to caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. As I said before, this is a condition that doesn't just impact the person diagnosed, but the whole family, the whole community, a whole support network. Um, and there are real health impacts as well with that. Right. Uh, caregiving can be one of the greatest gifts that you can possibly give and receive. Right. To be able to do that, to be able to support a loved one. But it can also take its toll. It can be extremely isolating. Uh, caregivers of people with dementia suffer the greatest levels of are at great risk for loneliness and social isolation. Uh, it can be physically taxing. Uh, it can be mentally, emotionally exhausting. Um, and so it's really important that that caregivers care for themselves, that whole put your oxygen mask on, you know, in the event of, of an emergency, put your oxygen mask on before assisting others, that caregivers really get the care they need as well. So true. So, so true. So what kind of innovation is happening with Alzheimer's disease and how has treatment evolved? The, the innovations that are happening today are so exciting. So there is a, a new blood test to help diagnose Alzheimer's, which is a huge innovation because uh, before that you'd have to have a very expensive PET scan, $8,000 that's not reimbursed, uh, and, um, or, and or a spinal tap, which is not a lot of fun. Not the worst thing in the world, but not a lot of fun. But we're looking at an era over the next year or two where you will be able to get a, a first, sort of first line of defense do you have these what they call biomarkers or indicators in your blood? So that's cheap, it's quick, it's less expensive. That's really exciting. Also, there are um, I'm wearing a watch that's actually collecting my data. Um, I do memory tests on it, cognitive tests mm -hmm. uh, over years. This is a part of a clinical trial. And it's also tracking the way I speak, my gait. So there are ways that artificial intelligence now will be able to detect. They're not treatment per se as yet no, but, but but until you know what is starting and when then you can start applying those treatments that we're finding or or risk reduction interventions yep. earlier yes yeah, so it's, much exciting stuff yeah. happening in the early detection space and i love that that where just our voice or our daily habits wearing a watch might be able to help detect that early warning sign so that we can do something about it all of these studies of lifestyle and preventive measures you know, results coming in and, and then doing new generations of trials and studies. I mean, this is really giving us a lot of, um, you know, a lot of information that can help uh, shed light on a better path forward. And then these new therapeutics. So, I mean, there's just so much innovation, uh, but it, we need more faster, you know, and it's really, as I said, all hands on deck for that. But it sounds promising, truly. What you both just said is very promising. Very and promising. And if inspires. people want to do something, they can, a healthy person of any age can do something like this. Love that. That's so easy. All right, let's talk about you two, shall we? Um, so how do you two work together and you do seem to finish each other's sentences <laughs> and call each other honey and I, I need to know how does this work here well scott is a board member of bright focus foundation but that is actually a result not a cause that is of our shared passion which i'm sure you can tell yes. um scott was at the motion picture and television fund um 
helping them there when we met to work uh, for the benefit of Bright Focus. Um, but now we're doing a lot of other presentations and things together just because we both care a lot. And uh, and he's he's not too difficult to deal no. with no, most that's, of the time. That's not what he said about you. But Uh-oh. anyway, no, that yeah, was no. Right. I mean, I think you know, I'm I'm very proud of the work that we're doing here at St. John's and Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Um, and but we cannot go it alone. We really this the, this is all about the power of partnerships. Um, it's really organizations like the Bright Focus Foundation that will help us all uh, get further in in taking on this devastating condition um this is uh, all hands on deck you know we need community uh philanthropy uh clinical everybody really needs to work together and that's why it's so important that's why i really enjoy working with nancy uh and you know she has strategic partnerships in her in her job title right so in her (laughs) dna it goes beyond the the title yeah so in her dna and and that's really what it's about a collaborative partnered approach and that's what you guys are doing about outreach oh absolutely yes yes we're we're doing a lot of outreach together and um our foundation started a program using the entertainment industry to do outreach especially to those underreached communities who aren't going to sit around and listen to no offense, mm-hmm. honey, uh, a white guy in a white jacket talking about amyloid and tau, but they will watch um, Grey's Anatomy and see that, you know, the black neurosurgeon's wife who was just diagnosed and is in denial, they relate to her. So mm-hmm. we are doing now a talk show called Brain Info Live that we are doing all over the country and in different languages that uses TV, movies, um, non-traditional ways of engaging to get, to break down the stigma and to get people more real information because it's easier for them to hear it from a musician or a celebrity or, uh, you know, someone doing an exercise class than from your typical scientist or doctor. Makes sense. really does. Well, we're just about at the end of our broadcast today, but I want to ask both of you, if you had to leave our audience with just one thing about Alzheimer's, what would it be? The one thing I would leave people with is that you are not alone. This is incredibly common. We've all walked this walk and talked this talk, some of us numerous times. My grandmother when I was a teenager, my mom now. And of course, I live it and breathe it every single day. So don't hesitate. You're not alone. It's like being pregnant. When the, when it happens to you for the first time, you feel like it's never happened to anybody else, but everyone around you has gone through it. So you're not alone. Reach out, engage, ask us for support. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Absolutely. You know, and, and that that is, we, we are not alone and we need to, to band together. I mean, I think for me, with Alzheimer's, it's it's all too often and unfortunate that the thought process is, well, there's nothing you can do. And really, I, I firmly believe nothing could be further from the truth. And we can all do something today and every day, right? On an individual level, we can make healthy, brain healthy choices, lifestyle choices. On a collective level, uh, we can work together to improve public health. We can support policies that are brain health oriented, and we can support the science. We, you know, again, cures aren't just going to fall from the sky. We can support science, research, clinical programs that are going to make the difference so that we have a future where we don't have the 150 million people that are predicted to have Alzheimer's disease globally by 2050. We can change that number. Take that 150 million and cut that by 40%, hopefully even more. But we have to do something. We have to do it now. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. But it's been so encouraging to me to have you both here. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Pleasure. Thank you, Nancy. It's been a great pleasure for me. And thank you to St. John's Health Center Foundation for making this podcast possible. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. And we want to encourage you to send in your very own health questions to us here. And all of our experts, our doctors, our surgeons will answer them for you. And you can send your questions to your healthy dose podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Kim Douglas with your healthy dose. <laughs>